This was once a prosperous village on the fertile plains of the River Barker in Eritrea. In 1977, the families here boasted as many as 500 head of cattle each. Even in 1981, the grass was knee high. But by 1984, after three years of continuous drought, the villagers finally gave up and joined the flood of refugees marching to the growing number of relief camps in Sudan and Ethiopia. The African famine is the worst catastrophe faced by mankind since the Second World War. In Sudan and Ethiopia alone, more than a million people have died since 1983. At least 15 million people in Africa still need help. Tigray province, a wild place, racked by war, scorched by drought, visited by famine. Makele, a village swamped by 85,000 starving people, food for less than a third that number. The Red Cross have picked out 500 mothers and children out of the thousands and are treating them in an improvised shelter. It's run by an Anglo-Swiss nurse from Hertfordshire. The loneliness of her position is one shattering image in this vast desert, the despair of the 10,000 people. And so at random, she picks 300. I mean, most of the people holding up their babies, hoping that they'll be picked. And the 300 who are picked are ashamed of being picked. And they're taken behind this waist-high wall where this woman gives them butter oil, because that's all there is to eat. And they turn their backs in shame on the ones who had in effect been condemned to die, the other 9,700. And they have no antipathy in their expression, just this amazing dignity and resignation. And I presume those people died. After I saw the TV broadcast, I called Paula, who was working up at the Tube in um, Newcastle. I knew Midge was up there, Midge, you're from Ultrafox, who's a mate of mine. I said, did you see that thing on TV, you know? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I want to make a record. And he said, oh, that's a good idea. Then I rang Sting, and he just said straight away, I'm in. I rang Simon LeBon, and uh, he said, brilliant. And on the way home, uh, I passed by this antique shop. I was looking in, there was Gary Kemp from Spandau Ballet pointing at something to the owner. So I rushed in and said something to him, and he said, well, wait till we're back from Japan, because we want to do it. Then Midge sent me down a tape of do 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 and that was going over and over, you know? And I rang him up, and I said, that's Zed Cars. And he goes, no, it's not. And I said, yes, it is. I said, if it's not Zed Cars, it's the Dam Busters or something. So I went to visit a mate of mine who was ill, and in the way over, I wrote, um, it's Christmas time, there's no need to be afraid. It's Christmas time, and there's no need to be afraid. At Christmas time, he led in life and vanished shade. Yeah. Hello, George. Are you awake? Do you want me to call you back? I remember ringing Boy George in hour. New York and he was still in bed and I said, get on a Concord and All right, don't go out. get over. And he did. It's half ten, you lazy f***. You want to do that, yeah? Okay. I'm a papa. I'm a pop star. Uh, Round around the world at Christmas time In our world of plenty Christmas time Joe Cocker Joe cock up. You Irish munchkin. Pray for the other ones At 
I saw Simon Napier Bell, who's WAM's manager, he said, well, how much money do you think you're going to make? And I said, I have really no idea. And he said, well, let's say that you got a 22% off the record company, which is a big percentage, and you give your publishing money, and you sell half a million because you won't have the record out until two weeks before Christmas. And that's selling a lot in two weeks. You're only going to make 75,000 quid. And I said, well, you have to do something. And then I phoned up each guy of the big chain stores like this Masters Voice, Virgin, Woolworth, Smith's. And they said, OK, well, we're into it. If the others would do it, and I said, in fact, you're the last guy I'm calling. And I said, so, uh, and they've all agreed. He said, oh, OK, well, we're into it then. And that was the big one, because now we are getting very close to 100%. Is that it? Well, you know, this is the, this is just the number one thing. Yeah, yeah, on Simon Bates' show that everyone make it the biggest selling record ever. It's easy. You know, you've got four weeks to do this. Of course, in three weeks, I mean, the subsequent stuff, everybody knows about people buying 50 records and giving 49 back. Butchers ringing me up and saying they've got a shop front window. Can they stock the record and put it in their window? Fortnum and Mason's ringing up and saying, oh, we're allowed to sell records, you know, and the restaurant down there is selling 2,000 in a day. Do They Know It's Christmas entered the British charts at number one, topped the charts in 12 other countries, and made a staggering eight million pounds. This encouraged other musicians at home and abroad, and by the summer of 85, more than 20 similar records have been made. We Are The World was number one in 16 countries and sold eight million copies. This family is one of the great shameful things of our time, and I find it an indictment of us and a pathetic way of living that a piece of plastic seven inches across with a hole in the middle is the price of someone's life this year. There's nothing you can do that can't be done. There's nothing you can sing that can't be sung. Nothing you can say, but you can learn how to play the game. It's easy. All you need is love. The only way to describe it is like being taken through various degrees of hell, I suppose. You go in and you see people that are relatively all right. You see thousands waiting to enter into the camps. Then you get taken into these sheds where there's corpses lying beside live people. And then you do the sort of useless things like you cry and uh, that gives way to despair and rage that humans can still do this to one another and allow it to happen. That's what you see and that's maybe how you feel. Actually, you can't even begin to grasp the vastness of it, the all-encompassing hugeness of the horror of it. There's nothing you can know that isn't known. Nothing you can see that isn't shown. Nowhere you can be that isn't where you're supposed to be. It's easy. I went to Africa to find out what they wanted me to do. And then I went back to England with this shopping list of things. So I had to set up Band-Aid Trust to enable us to spend the money, the trustees to protect the money, people's interest, and the volunteers to act uh, in spending the money. I think the first person to come in to me was Kevin Gendon, because I was beginning to get very worried. I mean, I didn't know how to order grain. I didn't know, you know, this, that and the other. Kevin Gendon walked in he said, look, I'm an architect. I've worked for the Red Cross in Ethiopia. I'd like to help you. Kevin Gendon became Band-Aid's unpaid project director. 
His task was to translate the money raised into action, to deal with the numerous shopping lists sent to Band-Aid by the aid agencies. Okay. Penny Jandon chose and bought all the essential supplies Band-Aid sent to Africa. At three o'clock. If Bob Geldof was a public face of Band-Aid, Kevin okay. Jandon and the other volunteers were the backstage stars of the show. An office was set up in a disused bus garage in London. The equipment was donated and nothing was spent on administration so that every penny from the record would go to relief work in Africa. And then I was having tea one day in the afternoon and this woman sent across a message saying, do you need help? And I wrote yes on the serviette and sent it back. And that was Valerie Valblondo, who was a businesswoman. As soon as it comes in, I'll get back to you on it. We've got an urgent request from UNICEF and UNHCR for some tetracycline. Then Judy Anderson, who's an Atlanta labor lawyer from America, she had sailed across the Atlantic with four of her girlfriends and they had pitched up in London and she saw what was going on and she came down and said, can I help? Yes. And bit by bit, there was this nucleus of professional people who gave up what they were doing to do this because they had to do it. Then Ken Martin come in, who has subsequently now done all our shipping and procurement and stuff. And it came down to that it was cheaper to actually charter a vessel of this size than pay the commercial freight rates. And in doing so, we actually created a lot of free space that we could then offer to the other relief agencies and carry their cargo basically free of charge. Band-Aid responded immediately to accommodate the sudden flow of cargo that was coming forward. A lot of cargo that we've carried would never have gone because the sort of agency involved, the charity involved, local churches and fates just didn't have cash. It had just donations in kind and never had the money to pay the commercial freight rates. So the savings we've made for those organizations is not just the freight rate, but in terms of aid that's gone down to Ethiopia and Sudan, it's been the whole value of the cargo created from a free shipping. Collectively, we take this ship band Every bond you break, every 
Our contributions, however small, will help to relieve the suffering of the famine stricken areas of the third world. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious, hear us. Now, you may remember a couple of three weeks ago I came into assembly and in my hand I had some empty sacks big brown ones, and I stood at the front, and I said that we were going to try and fill them for Band-Aid. Do you remember that? Yes. Right. And we were trying, through them, to fill our sacks with a sort of food that could be sent to Africa to help those people this Christmas. Well, we've got some good news. And this is the last sack because all the others are full to the top. I shall take it down to the station tomorrow, and the train will take it to London, and to get put on a boat, and take it to Ethiopia. The sack's going to be opened, and then all the people are going to eat it, the food. All the starving people. Right. All the really starving people are going to eat it. I'd like to get, for the people who are starving, to get the sugar and the flour. So it, could, so it could help them um, cope with their starvation. I brought a bag of sugar. I thought it would be good because every grain helps the Ethiopians. And It's about time someone did something about the famine in Africa, so um, it doesn't really matter whether anyone, what age they are as long as the food gets to them because I mean there's people dying and we've got a lot to eat and they've got nothing. I, I, I think that the government should, should help more so not really put putting it the foot in. You know, they should get, give some more money to help. Starving people, especially children, are highly susceptible to disease. When a family is admitted to a camp, the children are examined, weighed, and then measured. The ratio of weight to height is a way of telling just how undernourished a child is. The food given to these children is a mixture of milk powder, sugar, and butter oil along with high-protein biscuits, grain and medicines, these were the essential supplies Band-Aid shipped immediately to the famine areas. Every copy of the Band-Aid record sold bought 29 high-energy biscuits. One high-energy biscuit will keep a child alive for one day. This year, while famine was ravaging Africa, the modern farming methods of Western Europe and North America produced grain surpluses of 113 million tons. In order to support the market price, the EEC presides over mountains and lakes of surplus food, which it stores or destroys at high cost. It makes little emotional sense, it makes absolutely nil moral sense. And if your morality is faulty, then your logic must be spurious. Therefore, the one thing we must do is eliminate those mountains because it is also a truism that all aid benefits the donor countries as opposed to the recipients. For what? I mean, at the moment you've got a problem with the uh, butter mountain, you don't know how to dispose of it. To sell to the Russians is the cheapest way. I'm sorry, but butter doesn't do very much good in Africa. Well, butter oil actually does. It is one of the major but supplementary oil, if foods. You can, if you can get it done. But it is a byproduct of butter. Yes. Yeah. But look, a lot is good. A lot of surface food is good. But don't but Prime forget... Prime Minister, there are millions dying, and that's the terrible thing.
Faced with the apparent indifference of Western governments and with a growing awareness of the scale of the long-term needs of Africa, Band-Aid was determined to raise a much larger amount of money. The two shows are absolutely outstanding. The American show, which was looking terribly weak, is now as strong as Who the English show. Here? We are both sold out, by the way, which is one relief. The now. new entries are the Beach Boys, Tina Turner, Ashburn Simpson, Paddy the Bell, Bob Dylan. I wouldn't go if it was just the Wurzels, and it was the Wurzels and Bucks Fizz, I wouldn't bother. But, I mean, since it is all these people, I mean, it's making history. I'm very proud to be asked to do it, because Everybody's involved and it's just great to be part of something like this. It's just too obvious to say that it's for a good cause. Everybody's just mucking in and we've all got, you know, between 15 and 20 minutes and a little, little tiny bit of gear, you know, but it's, it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful tomorrow, I know it is. In the old days, it used to be the government that did all this and the pop stars just shook their heads and were generally considered silly people. It's happened the other way around. It's the whole system has to go back to what it originally was supposed to be, where the governments help the people. I mean, there shouldn't be starvation in 1985. But I've seen people crying over this, you know, emotional and so happy somebody's doing something. I mean, I think it's an old-fashioned idea that um, kids and pop stars and all these people are sort of weirdos. <laughs> they just, they, they live in your street, you know. They're just people, they're our kids. When you hear about all the EC food mountains, you know, and all kind of, I mean, they, they're all humans that we should all pull together on this. It's wrong to see that many people dying. Yeah. In this day and age, it's just, just a dumb shame that you have to do it. Yes. I mean, people shouldn't, people shouldn't be allowed to start like that. That's the government the should be able to do more about it. I find it incredible that the, sort of, the mass of people probably feel that something should be done, yet their own governments just don't do anything. They do very little. You know, it's, the very fact that it has to be done by people giving their own money is ridiculous. I mean, we've given enough money into government, why can't they spend some of our money giving it back? You can be absolutely sure that on the day you die, there'll be somebody alive in Africa because one day you bought a record or a book or watched a pop concert. And that at one is a compliment and a triumph. And on the other hand, it's the ultimate indictment of us all. There must be better systems.
What time is it? It's Christmas time. There's no need to be afraid. At Christmas time, we let in light and we vanish And in our Just before you went on, were you excited? Or did you just think it was going to be normal when you went on? No, 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 I was frightened. I think I was more nervous today than I've ever been. Yeah. Pretty hot, yeah. But I think it's more nervous than anything what you see here. It's pretty nervous. It's the words of wisdom, let it be. No problem. I'd like to dedicate this song to my son, to all our children, and to the children of the world. I, I could be king. And you, you could be my queen. For nothing could drive them away. Ah, we could beat them just for one day.
Two days after Live Aid, the Minister for Overseas Development, Timothy Raisin, was dispatched on a fact-finding mission to Ethiopia. On his return, the British government announced that the airlifts of famine supplies, which it had threatened to stop, would continue until the end of 1985. These Hercules airlifts are vitally important. Air transport is expensive, but in Ethiopia, there was no other way of getting regular supplies to the famine-stricken areas of the interior. In the greater London region, there are 8,000 miles of tarmacked roads. In Ethiopia and Sudan, which together are bigger than the whole of Western Europe, there are only 9,000 miles of all-weather roads in total. In May, news had broken of a severe famine in the Darfur province of Western Sudan too big for air transport to cope with. Over three million people were suddenly discovered to be in need. The situation became even more extreme when the antiquated railway line, the only reliable link to Port Sudan and food, was destroyed by floods. A huge trucking operation was required. At the insistence of project director Kevin Gendman, band aid responded immediately. There were risks. Could new trucks be imported quickly enough and were the second-hand trucks repairable? The criticism that is being made is that you are in danger of getting your fingers burnt, mm. both on the trucking deal and on the timing of your operation. Mm. We've been under criticism since we started by everybody, so uh, I'm used to that. We had to set up a trucking corporation in a desert. We found this geosource fleet, which were a mining company, with a compound, with a quarter of a million pounds worth of brand new spare parts, with oil storage facilities, Land Rovers, forklifts and cranes, and 60 trailers, never mind the tractor to pull them, and I think 45 trucks. We got it for $800,000, which eliminated our problem of building a compound for a million, eliminated our parts problem, eliminated our domestic problem. It was the perfect thing. It was in sight, and we just had to wait for the agreement with the Sudanese to bring in the ones that were in perfect mechanical order. Now, when you see pictures of broken axles, you think, oh my God, they've got a complete turkey. I've got to tell you that broken axles are endemic. The trucks are now on their way to Sudan. Our compound is in place. The trucks that everybody said wouldn't work, we have over 50% of them working now. We're going to run this trucking operation at cost. So we break up the cartel in Port Sudan, which prevents the flow of food to the west and therefore people die. We have a free shipping service and we have a direct line from London through the shipping service, through our trucks, right out to the west. That to me is not a cock-up, that to me is pretty well thought out. As with regard to getting our fingers burned, I don't know any people who've gone into Africa who haven't had their fingers burned one way or the other, and the people who've had their fingers most burned are the ones who are dying. After Band-Aid set up its Sudanese trucking operation, the cost of transport fell, before the agencies had to compete with each other and pay inflated prices. But now, for the first time, food and essential medical supplies could move more efficiently inside Sudan. And the huge stockpiles at the docks were reduced. In Ethiopia, transport is centrally controlled but there were simply not enough trucks to distribute food regularly to those in need. 35,000 tons of dry rations a month were allocated to the people of Wallo province. But in May and June, although enough food was stored in the country, hardly any got through. They said, we need trucks, so we got the US government, who have not invested heavy capital projects in Ethiopia because of the ideological differences between the countries and we've put together this 300 truck fleet. Now that is massive, under UN flags. And they have said to us that the fleet can go under a UN flag into Tigray and Eritrea. Now what that means is kind of like Britain being at war with France and you get a food convoy leaving London to feed the people of Paris. You wouldn't be allowed, at either border you wouldn't be allowed, but they've allowed that. This is the most marvellous thing we've had here in years. I want to congratulate you. Because you're raising money 
to relieve suffering in Africa and you're enjoying yourselves at the same time. And what can be better? One, two, three, objet card. Yeah. 
your tits are showing. Oh, shush, Paul. Did you like that? What was it like? Brilliant. God, the end was just unbelievable. Unbelievable. We're conducting the, that band. <laughs> Great. God, <laughs> ask me a I'm question. I'm proud, I'm <laughs> proud, I'm proud. Uh, yeah, brilliant. And what did you think of Let It Be? Was that just incredible? What was it like being a backing vocalist for them? Well, there's McCartney, like, beside on the piano. I couldn't believe it, you know. And uh, my seven times, uh, let it be, let it be. Yeah. It was great. It was just, it's unbelievable. It's staggering. Ho oh, hum. Right. Let's go home. August the 6th, 1985, was a good day for the inhabitants of Relief Camp No. 2 at McKaylee, the very place from which the BBC reported the first news of the famine. Fifteen thousand people were going back home to their villages, with seeds to plant and tools and dry rations to carry them through till harvest time. They were each given one bar of soap, three cooking utensils, one blanket, nine pounds of milk powder, a gallon of cooking oil, a pickaxe or hoe, a yard of plastic sheeting, 44 pounds of teff seeds and 22 pounds of chickpea seeds for planting, 100 pounds of grain, a packet of biscuits, and a ration card for the food they would need later. Unless people are able to return to the land in order to plant for the future, there will be no food in Ethiopia tomorrow, rain or no rain. While the population of the Sahel region of Africa has been growing at a rate of 2.5% per year, food production has been steadily falling. This is not due to a lack of rainfall. In the early 1970s, when international credit was easy to obtain and commodity prices were high, Africa was encouraged to borrow huge amounts of money and forsake food production for cash crops. In 1984, several Sahelian countries harvested record crops of cotton. In the same year, they also imported record amounts of grain. Then commodity prices collapsed. Cotton, Sudan's major export crop, fell in value by over 50%. This left sub-Sahara Africa drowning in a sea of debt. Between 1982 and 1985, interest and capital repayments rocketed from $5,000 million to some $19,000 million. The aid given by the West to the Sahel is only one-tenth of those countries' foreign debts. For every dollar we send famine-stricken Africa in aid, 
we demand $10 back in debt settlements. Sudan and Ethiopia together owe $13,000 million. This means that each Sudanese owes $545 to Western banks, and each Ethiopian is $62 in debt to Western and Russian creditors. The last famine struck Ethiopia as recently as 1973, and there was a generous response from the people of the West. Seven years later, the same pictures appeared on our television screens. If those people saved from the famine are to be given a chance of a future, there must be a change of emphasis in the long-term aid offered Africa. In all these areas where people were suffering because of the lack of rain, people are sitting on water. There is underground water. Our problem is how to get to that underground water because it requires technology, which we don't have. To supply food for these people keeps them alive from day to day, but in a sense also it, it uh, destroys their, their way of life as well. They simply come to depend on regular food supplies. Um, what we need are long-term solutions which enable people to, to develop a new economic role for themselves. Now what we hope will happen is that uh, the public through the media will uh, see the need to help those farmers whose lives they have saved to go back to their villages and cultivate and be self-sufficient. And that's why it's so important for voluntary agencies to stay with this situation. There are no instant cures. There are no uh, dramatic uh, ways of fixing this situation. It needs a long, patient approach of putting resources into agricultural development and water development. Everyone goes on about this childbirth thing. People have a lot of children there because the life expectancy of a child is six months. And so they want their children, you know, they want to have a family. They need people to sow the ground if and when it grows again. And that's part of the job. Make it grow again. Introduce things that are applicable to these people that they tell you about. And give their children and them a life that they don't have now. Band-Aid, in the hope of encouraging self-sufficiency, has committed £30 million to fund small projects in health, agriculture and irrigation. Projects more appropriate to the needs of the rural communities. When um, people talk about long-term development, they talk about you know, locally-based initiatives, uh, activating the rural economy, uh, ecological bankruptcy. And, uh, it's boring what it really means and what irritates you when people say, well, what are you spending your money? You say, in long-term development, it's, it's crucial because what it means is giving people a life after you've kept as many alive as you possibly can, um, so that when the next drought hits, as it will, they're better able to withstand the enormous effects of it and hopefully escape the mass death that inevitably follows. And uh, it isn't an exciting thing. It's not exciting to watch a tree grow or a child um, become an adult. It takes 20 years for a tree to grow, and it takes 20 years for the child to grow, but they will, if you do it right. And that's basically what long-term development means.
chip inside her head gets switched to overload And nobody's gonna go to school today She's gonna make them stay at home And Teddy doesn't understand it He always said she was good as gold And he can see no reasons Cause there are no reasons What reason do you need to be sure? Machine is kept so clean and the types to a waiting world. A mother feels so shocked by this world is rock, and the thoughts turn to their own little girl. Sweet 16 ain't a peachy king. Well, it ain't so neat to admit to be. They can see no reasons, but there are no reasons. What reasons do you need? To play with the toys for a while And school's out early And soon we be learning And the lesson today is How to die I want to show 
Oh, yes, it will. 